Good evening. And thank you for joining us uh, for another lecture in our inaugural lecture series. I am Professor Devendra Kodwani, uh, Executive Dean in the Faculty of Business and Law here at the Open University. I am proud and privileged to be hosting one of our inaugural lectures which showcases our research, teaching, and knowledge exchange portfolios. Each year, the Vice Chancellor invites newly appointed and promoted professors to give an inaugural lecture. Over the course of a year, our, our inaugural lecture series provides an opportunity to celebrate academic excellence with each lecture representing a significant milestone in an academic's career. This evening, we will hear from Professor Stephanie Pivel, St Professor of Law and Social Justice in the Open University Law School, who will explore some aspects, effects of the empowerment of individuals and organizations to make delegated legislation, including the regulations about wearing face coverings in 2020. She will also reflect on the empowering effect of the education, especially that offered by the Open University. But before we begin, some housekeeping. The lecture will be followed by a Q&A session, and then we invite you to celebrate with us downstairs for those of, those of uh, you who are with us in person. For anyone in the audience using Twitter, please feel free to tweet using the hashtag displayed and tagging at Open University and let the world join us this evening. For member of, members of our audience joining us via YouTube, please use the email address provided and keep your comments and questions brief so that we can address them during the Q&A session. And now it is time to hand over to Hugh McFall, head of the law school, who will introduce Professor Stephanie Pivel. Thank you, Dev. So this is a great event. We've been looking forward to this for quite some time. And uh, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce Stephanie Pywell's inaugural lecture on aspects of empowerment in legislation and education. Now, I've worked for, with Steph for at least 10 years, but her association with the Open University uh, spans much longer than that. Over 40 years, including first as a student, then as an associate lecturer, then as a lecturer, then as a senior lecturer, and now as a professor in the Open University Law School. And I was very amused, I was speaking to some of your friends who have come out in force, it's great to see you all here tonight, and uh, one of them said that they threw a party for you in 1988, 1988 a goodbye to the OU party. So how wrong was that? So uh, they got that one wrong. So Steph uh, studied an open degree with us, and has very fond memories of attending uh, the Open University summer schools and uh, learning as part of her studies of mathematics complicated mathematical formulae to the tune of somewhere over the rainbow. So I propose that if we give a very loud round of applause as she take, takes the stage she'll be forced to have a little rendition of that during <laughs> her lecture. So uh, her experience as an Open University student has shaped her commitment to creating a welcoming and accessible learning environment for our students. A commitment that was reflected in her creation and maintenance of, of qualification guides, study websites, teaching on level one modules, but also in her work supporting the development of our OU PhD programme. Steph has always combined a flair for innovation with her commitment to student success, and this potent combination was recognised in her Open University Individual Teaching Award in 2019 for the highly successful 12 Introductory Steps to Law, which provides our graduate entry students with the foundations of legal knowledge to allow them to study with us through the rest of the degree. Stephanie's research interests are diverse. Her article on delegated legislation has been described as the go-to piece for anyone working in the area, while her empirical work 
on the law governing weddings and related ceremonies was cited 19 times in the Law Commission's 2022 report celebrating marriage. So it's great that we can celebrate with Steph today her promotion to professor and it now gives me great pleasure and I want to hear a very large and loud round of applause for Steph as she takes the stage and uh, to welcome Professor Stephanie Pywell to the podium. Thank you, Devon Tew, and good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for attending this lecture, whether you're here in the lecture theatre or online. I must first thank everyone who has helped me to achieve this absolute pinnacle of imposter syndrome. <laughs> my my long-suffering husband, Barry, daughter, Alison, and son-in-law, Anthony, who've sat through this before, my wonderfully supportive colleagues in the law school and beyond, and the professors who generously supported me throughout the lengthy promotion process, roughly in order of their involvement, Professors Simon Lee, Paul Catley, Jeff Peters, Richard Holty, Dev Kodwani, Mark Fenton O'Creevy, Rebecca Probert, Peter Bartlett, Peter Kumper, and Louise Mesmarland. And I'm immensely grateful to everyone who sent lovely messages, cards, flowers, and gifts when they heard that I'd been promoted to the Chair in Law and Social Justice. And this event hasn't organised itself, so huge thank yous go to the colleagues in the rights, archives, audiovisual, marketing and communications, and of course, catering teams who have made this evening happen. And I'm looking forward to going downstairs and meeting the main reason why I have a good work-life balance, my two-year-old grandson, Sammy. I'm going to reflect on some consequences of empowerment in the form of a legislation sandwich. As you can see, the OU is such a special place that we have bespoke blue bread. And the first slice is a summary of the first 51 years of my education and work which, as one of Alison's favourite childhood books, Janet and Alan Alberg's Bye Bye Baby, describes itself as a sad story with a happy ending. The filling shares some of my research into delegated legislation, which is law that's made when ministers and other individuals or bodies are empowered to make law. The second slice is an outline of some of the things I've been empowered to do since I started delivering education, and a brief reflection on how my colleagues and I try to empower our students. The filling's a bit stodgy, so I've made the bread as light as I can. So, the first slice of bread. My education certainly wasn't a straightforward path from primary school to university. Because I was such a swatty little girl with curvy grips, my Thai-loving headmaster suggested to my parents that I should go to a boarding school that would stretch me. Christ Hospital is a genuine charity. Fees are non-existent or means-tested, and you can't go there if your parents are rich. Excited by Enid Blyton's stories of midnight feasts, I passed the entrance exams, and that was that. This is a rare photo of me not swatting. Jane and I tended a tiny rectangle of earth, optimistically dubbed a garden, just outside the science block. We constructed a space age themed entry for a flower arranging competition. It was a rocket like sculpture made of mud with homegrown marigolds stuck into it, and it was highly commended. I did well in O levels, but I was prescribed sleeping pills because I was revising for about 10 hours a day. So my parents wisely decided I might be healthier if I left. So I went to Stevenage College of Further Education, where I, far greener than anything we'd stuck into the mud rocket, um, was working till 10 o'clock at night and crying my eyes out because I was terrified of the smoking, lolling, enormous men who were there. I didn't know anything about it. And I was studying for four A-levels, two S-levels, which were higher than A-levels, and use of English, which I had to do to go to Oxbridge. So again, steered by my parents' concern, the 10 o'clock stuff really wasn't working, so I had to go to work. So I enjoyed four Saturdays as a Littlewoods cashier before becoming a laboratory assistant and then an office junior. And I had to sort the post and push a trolley around a huge office to deliver it. 
I learnt typing and shorthand and eventually became a director's secretary with a status-defining, state-of-the-art IBM electric golf ball typewriter. And then I met and very quickly married Barry. He realised my achievements didn't match my intellect. So he overruled my desire to be a dutiful wife who would hand scrub his shirt collars. And he secretly requested a prospectus from an institution whose 1982 logo you might recognise. I'm delighted to welcome online my tutor counsellor from that time, Professor Susan Tresman, and my maths tutor, the Reverend Elizabeth Bunker. I studied science, maths, statistics, and economics, and then, really proud of having BA after my name, promptly became a full-time mum to Alison, trained as a tutor in basic adult literacy, and started a home-based word processing business. And through the tutoring, I met a dyslexic woman who was training to be a legal executive. She confided her worries about producing assignments, so I word processed them for her, correcting her grammar and spelling. And after the first one, I excitedly told Barry, I found what I want to study when Alison goes to school. It's law. So I studied for the A-level at evening classes when she went to nursery school, and for my Bachelor of Laws and PhD at the University of Hertfordshire when she was at primary school. And as who, has, uh, who didn't say this, actually said he would, I'm very honoured that the head of Hertfordshire Law School, Penny Carey, the Dean, is online joining us this evening. 30 years after the Mudrocket, I got a lovely job in legal academic publishing with loads of letters after my name. But six years later, I resigned following a nervous breakdown after Barry recovered from 10 months of a life-threatening illness. I did freelance work, and in 2009, I became an associate lecturer at Guess Where? I slowly recovered, and on the 18th of November 2013, I started a one-year fixed-term post, guess what? You're ahead of me. <laughs> Finally empowering me to share my love of law with whole cohorts of students. Now, the sandwich filling. It's important that all citizens are empowered to find and understand the law that governs them, not least so that they can live their lives without breaking it. Almost everything that I'll say applies to the law of the UK as a whole. The devolved nations of the UK have their own separate lawmaking powers in specified areas, but they're still bound by some laws made in the Westminster Parliament. The UK has a common law system, so cases decided by the higher courts become part of the law. But we also have legislation, which is the law that's purpose-built and written down. And it's in bold font because it's legislation that I'll be talking about this evening. But first, I need to outline one aspect of the constitutional principle of separation of powers, which specifies that law should be made and applied by two separate state institutions. The legislature makes law. The UK's legislature is technically the king in parliament, and it consists of the elected House of Commons, who sit on green benches, the unelected House of Lords, who sit on red benches, and the hereditary monarch, who gives royal assent to every act of parliament. Acts are the UK's supreme source of law, and they're known as primary legislation. The executive applies the law. It consists of the Prime Minister, the government, which is appointed by the Prime Minister, and authorities such as the civil service, police, and local authorities. The separation of powers isn't perfect, because government ministers are usually MPs, and most votes in Parliament usually go the government's way, but there is a democratic element to parliamentary lawmaking, because MPs in the House of Commons are elected. The thing to remember from these two slides is the principle that neither the government nor individual ministers should have ultimate responsibility for legislation, because that is Parliament's job. As well as primary legislation, the UK has delegated legislation. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is law that's made by government ministers or organisations using powers delegated to them, and that's usually but not always done by an Act of Parliament, which is called an Enabling Act. It's the nature of research that you start searching for something, not knowing what you'll discover. And I was aghast at some of what I found when I started this unpromising sounding topic. I realised that I was discovering important information about the laws that govern this country, 
and despite having a PhD in law, I had no idea about it. And as I'll outline later, it's provided a huge boost to my career. As a student, I'd learned that there's a lot of delegated legislation, that it's very detailed and technical, that it's necessary to regulate all sorts of aspects of life, that Parliament hasn't got the time or expertise to make it, that it has the same force as primary legislation, and that it's laid before Parliament for scrutiny before it becomes law, which gives it democratic legitimacy. And it can be declared invalid by a court if it goes beyond the powers delegated to its maker by the Enabling Act. Lawyers call those last two characteristics checked and checks and balances because the law delegated lawmaking power isn't absolute. But when I was a freelancer writing a unit for the OU in 2012, I realised I couldn't explain delegated legislation to students because actually I didn't understand it. So I started rereading the leading textbooks on the English legal system, and they all agreed that there were various forms of legis delegated legislation. Statutory instruments, which I will refer to as SIs because I can't keep saying statutory instruments, um, bylaws, <coughs> orders in council, and courts rule committees. Well, I was mystified. Surely committees were going to be groups of people, not rules or laws. So my consequential Googling unearthed a document called a statutory instrument practice. And I discovered that since January 1948, SIs have been the main form of delegated legislation. There are also bylaws and a few other forms that I won't be discussing this evening. Now, I've done my best to verify everything in this lecture, but I have discovered that the more you know about delegated legislation, the more you realise how much you don't know. So I will be saying usually a lot, as you might have noticed. There are five types of SI. Orders in council and orders of council, both made by the Privy Council, which consists of about 700 past and present senior politicians, judges and religious leaders who are called the Right Honourable for life. Ministers are usually attended by only four government ministers plus any new councillors. So Privy Council meetings are a subgroup of elected MPs from the appointed government with the hereditary monarch, which is an imperfect example of democracy. The other three types of SIs are orders, rules and regulations, and they're usually made by a government minister who's usually a member of House of Commons, so they're green, but sometimes they're made by a statutory body. Official statistics confirm that there is a lot of delegated legislation. This chart shows that between 23 and 55 UK-wide Acts of Parliament were passed every year between 2004 and 2022. And this chart, where the vertical scale is about 50 times bigger or smaller, depending how your mind works, shows that between 1,225 and 3,481 SIs were made annually in that period. So there can be 100 times as many SIs as there are acts in a year. So you might think that Parliament would spend a lot of time carefully scrutinising this delegated legislation. You'll recall my student self's understanding that being laid before Parliament is one of the checks and balances that gives it democratic legitimacy. Well, let's explore the scrutiny procedures that can apply when delegated legislation is laid before Parliament. There are five broad types of scrutiny procedure, and every enabling act must specify which type applies to the SIs made under it. And this staircase represents the five types in increasing order of scrutiny. The size of each step has no other significance. The lowest level is made only. These SIs don't go before Parliament at all. They are usually non-contentious, such as orders bringing Acts of Parliament into effect on specific dates. Going up a step, laid only SIs are delivered to a specified office in each House of Parliament. Their titles are noted in the day's business papers and usually scrutinised by a joint committee of both Houses. But that's it. Parliament has no further say and they just become law. The middle step refers to SIs subject to the negative procedure. They're laid before Parliament, and if no objection is upheld in either House within 40 days, they become law without a debate, 
because most SIs, subject to the negative procedure, are actually law before they're laid before Parliament. Some are laid in drafts and aren't formally made until 40 days later, provided no objection is upheld, but generally they are law. And SIs that are subject to the affirmative procedure, on the second step down, are subject to a modicum of parliamentary scrutiny. They are actually voted on after a debate in the House of Lords and after consideration by the Delegated Legislation Committee in the Commons. They are usually laid in draft form and don't become law until they're voted on. But if an affirmative procedure SI is already made before it's laid, it can't come into force or remain in force unless it's voted on within a number of days, usually 28 or 40, that's specified in the Enabling Act. I will just ignore the more rigorous procedures on the top step because they apply only to particular types of SIs made under specified acts. Parliamentary sessional returns indicate the time spent on SIs. In 2019 to 2021, the House of Lords as a whole spent roughly 222 hours, which is about 11% of its business time, on SIs, passing 350 affirmative motions. Because of additional committee work, it's complicated, but that would be an average of just 38 minutes spent on each SI. It's impossible to give a comparable figure for the House of Commons, because almost all the detailed consideration takes place in committees, usually, but the whole House of Commons spent just 70 hours, which was 4.5% of its time, on 384 affirmative motions. So the fact is, that Parliament spends very little time debating delegated legislation, even though there's far more of it than primary legislation, and the elected House of Commons spends a lot less time than the unelected House of Lords. And if you care about the democratic element in lawmaking, that's a cause for concern. Let's consider how often each procedure is used. These charts show for 2019 to 21 the percentages of non-COVID and COVID-related SIs that were subject to each type of scrutiny. The blue represents the SIs that were made negative. They were law before they reached Parliament and remained law unless an objection was upheld. The pinkish red represents SIs that were made affirmative. They were also law before they reached Parliament, but they did have to be voted on within a specified number of days in order to remain law. The orange represents SIs that were draft affirmative. Those were actually voted on before they became law. And the thin blue line at the top of the non-COVID bar represents SIs that were draft negative, which were also laid before becoming law, but also automatically became law if no objection was upheld. So about 70% of non-COVID SIs and 97% of COVID SIs were made before Parliament had any chance to scrutinise them. I'll now outline what each type of SI is used for. Orders in council should be used only to effect constitutional change, really fundamental issues that affect the structure of the state. There are two sorts of order in council, one made under power delegated by Parliament in an enabling act, which I've mentioned, and another made under the inherent power of the Crown, also known as the royal prerogative, which is exercised by the hereditary monarch on the advice of the appointed government. Both can empower the king, in, sorry, the king in council to make orders. Orders made under powers delegated by parliament are called statutory orders in council. They're SIs, so they're given SI numbers and you can find them if you want to, I suspect you won't. Um, but those made under the royal prerogative are prerogative <coughs> orders in council and they are actually a form of primary legislation that's not scrutinised by Parliament at all. There's no index. You have to scour the individual sets of the minutes of Privy Councils in order to find them. One source of my aghastness was discovering an order in Council that was issued on the 3rd of May, May 1997, permitting appointments to a limited number of situations in the Prime Minister's office to be exempt from the normal civil service recruitment procedure. This was one day after Tony Blair became Prime Minister and it empowered him to appoint Alistair Campbell and Jonathan Powell to senior advisory roles and subsequent Prime Ministers have done the same. And on the 28th of August 2019, 
the late Queen approved the prorogation of Parliament by an order in council, although Boris Johnson's advice that she should do so was later ruled unlawful by the magnificent Lady Hale in the Supreme Court. Sad to say, my excitement reached fever pitch on the 10th of September this year because I saw orders in council being made at the Accession Council for King Charles III. Penny Mordaunt, the Lord President of the Council, read the drafts of 12 orders and to each one the King simply said, approved. It's important for citizens to know that Prime Ministers are empowered to make political appointments without a recruitment process and to mislead monarchs, even temporarily, into proroguing Parliament. More positively, here's the state, start of an annex to another order in Council. Now therefore know ye that we, by virtue of our prerogative royal and of our especial grace, will and ordain as follows. There shall be, and is hereby constituted and founded, a university with the name and style of the Open University. And you can just about see in the photo, attached to the seal attached to the Royal Charter bears an image of the Queen on horseback. Orders of council don't involve the monarch. Again, they can be statutory or prerogative, and the statutory ones can be SIs. They often grant permission for educational institutions to award degrees, or approve the rules of professional bodies, like the General Medical Council. Eight orders of council were made during accession council, this one orders the Lord Chancellor to affix the Great Seal to the proclamation of the King's accession. The other seven covered ceremonial matters like gun salutes and further proclamations, which I think is a sensible use of delegated power. The other three types of SI are theoretically designed to achieve distinct kinds of objective, but they can be used interchangeably. Orders usually bring about a one-off change. For instance, the Football Spectators 2022 World Cup Control Period Order 2022 doubled the period during which special measures to control football fans can be implemented, from the usual five days before a match to ten days before the first World Cup match. That order was made under the negative procedure. It was made at 20 to 11 on the 22nd of September, laid before Parliament at three o'clock on that date and came into force on the 14th of October. And again, I think that's an appropriate use of delegated power. Rules are usually procedural, so they stipulate how things should be done rather than what should be done. And that sounds fairly tedious, and often it is. But the Family Procedure Amendment No. 2 rules, 2022, include a change to the law governing injunctions, their court orders, that protect women and girls who've suffered or who are at risk of suffering genital mutilation. These injunctions can prevent potential victims from being threatened with violence or require that they be taken to school or social services at frequent intervals to ensure that they haven't come to harm. The law was that as soon as reasonably practical after the injunction had been granted, the person who'd sought it had to make sure the injunction was given to the person it was protecting the victim from. But under the new rules, that must be done within two days of the granting of the injunction. And if that doesn't happen, the injunction has no effect and the victim is unprotected. That change was made under the negative procedure, so Parliament didn't consider it and the title isn't exactly informative. The Family Procedure Rule Committee consulted on it, then made it on the 12th of July. It was laid before Parliament on the 18th of July. No objection was upheld, so it came into force without any debate on the 1st of October. And I'm not sure whether it's okay for something so important to become law without any parliamentary scrutiny. Regulations are the infamous detailed and technical legislation that I'd learnt about when I was a student. <coughs> They've recently achieved a much higher profile in our national life because of two momentous events, Brexit and Covid. And I'm not going to say another word about Brexit. <laughs> but the bad news is that I'm going to ask you to participate. So how many sets of COVID regulations do you think were made? And by that, I mean regulations with the word coronavirus in their title that were made as United Kingdom SIs, so excluding all the ones made in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, between the 10th of February 2020 and the 24th of September 22. Anyone? 
Somebody guess. Any number. Pick them. How many? 120. Any advance on 120? Higher, lower? Higher, lower. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, there were 390. But the Hansard Society, a charity that conducts independent research into Parliament and what goes on there, calculated that actually 582 coronavirus related virus SIs were laid between Parliament be before Parliament between the 1st of January 2020 and the 3rd of March 22. But many of those didn't have the corona word in the title. So as so often, it depends how you count. But there was certainly a very large number of regulations and they were often made at very short notice without any parliamentary scrutiny. Here's another example of some COVID regulations. There is. There really is. For health protection, coronavirus restrictions, entry to venues and events, England Amendment Regulations 2021. Two, one. Sorry, I've, I overshot myself. Go back. Sorry. Slide's gone missing. The, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Entry to Venues and Events England Amendment Regulations 2021. And it says, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Entry to Venues and Events England Regulations 2021 are amended as follows. In Regulation 4.8b, A, in Paragraph 1, for five and six, substitute four and five. And so it goes on. There's reams of it. And so you get the general idea. Some SIs are impossible to understand. And in order to make sense of regulation two, someone has to access the original regulations, locate the relevant paragraphs, then amend them in their head by substituting the numbers and dates. Lawyers can prepare keeling schedules to help Parliament understand the effects of SIs on pre-existing legislation, but they're time-consuming and expensive to produce, so they're used fairly infrequently. More often, there's an explanatory memorandum, but that can be nearly as opaque as the SI itself. And these non-emergency regulations were also made under the affirmative procedure, but again, they'd already come into force before Parliament voted, so the vote simply kept them in force. I found them now, they're in the previous slide. They were made... They were made on the 14th of December, came into force at six o'clock on the 15th, and were finally laid before Parliament at quarter past 11 on that date. Now, I hugely admire the lawyers whose minds are sufficiently logical to write SIs, but the results are rarely a quick and easy read. So I turned over two pages. The one to talk about is the Health Protection <laughs> Coronavirus. <laughs> the Health Protection Coronavirus wearing of face coverings in a relevant place England Reg Regulations 2020. They're a UK SI, but they applied only to England because the devolved nations of the UK make their own health-related legislation. I'm sure you will recall that if a non-exempt person didn't wear a face covering in specified situations, they could be charged with a criminal offence. And you might not have known that transgressors could be fined an unlimited amount. Such restrictive regulations are subject to the affirmative procedure, but these were made as an emergency measure. So they were made at nine o'clock on the 23rd of July, laid before Parliament at quarter past one that day and brought into force the next day. So they became part of the criminal law before Parliament had any chance to scrutinise them. And that was all perfectly lawful because Matt Hancock was empowered by an act of Parliament to bypass the draft affirmative procedure if he unilaterally decided the situation was an emergency. Now, that's a very convenient power to have if you're making potentially contentious legislation that some people regard as an unjustified restriction on individual liberty. Now, you might agree that it was an emergency that people should wear face coverings, but by mid-July, the government had known about COVID for six months. So I would argue that Matt Hancock should have drafted the regulations earlier, allowing time for them to be voted on by Parliament before they were needed, if face coverings were an important public health measure, or that he should have waited them for them to go through the normal draft affirmative procedure, if really they were just a populist platitude. Now you can have a look at what I started to read to you. <laughs> you see what sense it makes? <laughs> 
<coughs> so whatever you think of the government's effects to mitigate the effects of the virus, the fact is that a lot of regulations, including those that could involve someone getting a criminal record, were signed off by Matt Hancock without any meaningful parliamentary scrutiny at all. Now, I mentioned that delegated legislation can be declared invalid by a court if it goes beyond the powers delegated to the person or body that made it. But some acts make hardly any actual law. Their main effect is to empower ministers to make startlingly wide-ranging laws. And a good example of this is the Child Care Act 2016 which was described by a committee that examines the delegated powers in all bills that pass through the House of Lords as almost entirely enabling and containing virtually nothing of substance beyond a vague mission statement. Now, this Act requires the Secretary of State to provide 30 hours of free childcare per week for 38 weeks each year for qualifying children of working parents. But the great majority of the Act empowers the Secretary of State to make regulations creating criminal offences relating to disclosure about whether a child qualifies for free childcare, imposing a maximum penalty of £3,000 for those offences, changing the amount of the maximum penalty, and amending, repealing or revoking any provision made by or under an Act whenever passed or made. Let's think about that for a moment. The Secretary of State is empowered to change any law made by any Act of Parliament. And regulations made under the Child Care Act aren't subject to a special, more rigorous procedure. So they're likely to go through Parliament without being thoroughly scrutinised. And it would be hard for a court to rule that regulations were beyond the powers delegated to the Secretary of State because those powers are effectively unlimited. So I hope the sandwich filling has convinced you that it's at least arguable that government ministers, on the advice of their non-elected, not formally recruited political advisers, are over-empowered, because checks and balances aren't always as effective as one might hope. And that has resonances with my sad story with a happy ending. Because for years I wasn't empowered to achieve the things that I should have achieved after my excellent secondary education, because despite my parents and teachers repeated efforts to calm me down, there were actually no effective checks and balances on my paranoid perfectionist desire to get good grades. So, the second slice of bread. In 2012, when I discovered that textbooks weren't correct about the classification of SIs, I decided I ought to write an article about it. I was a nervous, unknown, freelance legal academic, and I was challenging some very eminent writers. So I emailed a clerk to a parliamentary committee who kindly agreed to check my draft article. He was, rightly, cautious about giving me his unqualified approval, but the fact that he didn't identify any inaccuracies gave me the courage to send it to New Law Journal, which published it a year later. A year or so after that, I got an email from Michael Zander, an emeritus professor of the London School of Economics. I initially thought it's got to be a scam, but actually, Professor Zander was requesting my permission to reproduce all of my little article, word for word, in the 2015 of his famous textbook, The Law Making Process. So I moved the word for about you know, a nanosecond before agreeing. <laughs> and, and that's how my name appears in the same acknowledgements list as Lords Newberger and Russell. In 2017, the law school's two professors encouraged me to write an article about it. It took more than a year, but the article published in January 2019 in the more prestigious Public Law was identified in 2020 as my best piece of work for the Research Excellence Framework 2021, which is sort of Ofsted for universities. So last year, I wrote about it in my application to become a professor. And this May, I was honoured to be invited by the Hansard Society to collaborate in writing a plain English explainer and that's going to be published on the Society's website, where it will empower more citizens to understand more about how their lives are governed. So thanks to the life-changing checks and balances provided by becoming a wife to Barry, a mother to Alison, and a granny to Sammy, and my very late developing understanding of how my mind works, and just over half a century after the mud rocket, my education has empowered me to have a job I love, the best colleagues I've ever had, and a title beyond my wildest dreams. <laughs>
And my colleagues and I now share the responsibility of empowering our students as much as we can through our teaching. Much of my own teaching work involves creating what I hope is a supportive learning environment, the background stuff like module guides, qualification guides and websites. Like SIs, those background things are excruciatingly detailed, but they're also not in the least glamorous, rather like SIs. I do hope, though, that unlike SIs, they are easy to understand because they and all our teaching materials must be accessible. Technically, students need to be able to get to the materials, either on an electronic device or in printed or audio form. We have specialist colleagues who advise us about assistive technology like screen readers, so we give every picture a long description, and we use informative surface text for hyperlinks, rather than saying, click here, which is useless if the link's broken. And materials need to be linguistically accessible. So we try to use normal, everyday language, rather than deploying obfuscatory terminology interwoven with the multiplicity of tautological and OTOC, tactical and sesquipedalian polysyllabic adornments. So we write to help students to understand, not to show them how much we've learnt. That said, it is very easy to forget that most people won't have heard of something you've been thinking about for 20 years. And I do sometimes forget that laid before Parliament is not a normal thing to say. Rest assured that no chickens or eggs were harmed in the making of this lecture. And teaching materials must conform to the three C's. The first C is consistent. When you're slogging away on your own at home to get those precious letters after your name, it is hopeless if two documents use different terms to mean the same thing. Consistency is a bit like having running water in your house. You don't notice it till it's not there. The second C is current. As well as keeping the law as up to date as our production processes allow, we try to keep students abreast of all the amendments to the university's central websites, regulations and documentation. And the third C is correct. Because if we publish something that's wrong, it's awful for students. And it's embarrassing, time-consuming and expensive for the university when we issue a blizzard of corrective emails and news items. And of course, materials must be equal, diverse and inclusive in their topics and language. So the law school has a champion and every module has a lead academic who makes sure we actively consider those features of our work. Our materials teach skills as well as simply imparting knowledge. We could just provide students with copies of everything we want them to read, but instead we gradually build up their library and research skills, empowering them to discover far more for themselves than we could ever teach them. And we actively teach academic skills like critical thinking and writing in certain ways, which empowers students to question and challenge what they read and to express their own views cogently and convincingly. And a team of dedicated colleagues works with us to ensure that our materials develop students' employability skills, such as problem solving, communication, collaboration and self-management. These empower students by increasing their self-esteem and ambition so that they'll dare to push themselves to achieve great things. And of course, the reason that we're empowered to empower students is that we work for the life-changing institution whose mission is to empower everyone through education. The Open University. Thank you. I'll never think about laid before Parliament in the same way again. That's uh, amazing. So we're going to have uh, time now to reflect on Steph's lecture and uh, uh, invite you here in the audience or uh, at home online to make some comments or ask some questions. So we're going to just go and sit over here, Steph. So we've got time for some questions. Uh, if you're with us in the room, please wait for the roving mic to come to you. Put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. Could I ask you to uh, say your name and where you're from? Uh, and also please keep the uh, questions short, partly to allow us to get quite a few questions in. And also because Steph is deaf, I'll be repeating uh, the questions to her. 
as well. So it would help me if they're quite short. Um, and for those um, attending the reception afterwards, uh, just bear in mind that uh, you might need, uh, Steph might ask you to speak clearly because it'll be quite a lively environment, I'm sure, once the Prosecco gets opened. Uh, there'll be plenty of noise and good cheer, hopefully. So uh, also we'd like to invite any comments or questions from the online audience using the uh, contact information and email provided on the slide. So let's have some uh, questions and comments. So if you're in the room, put your hand up. We'll get you the roving mic and uh, I will repeat the, the question. So uh, any, any thoughts or, or comments? Thank you. So, Cara, thank you. Hi, uh, Cara Johnson from the Open University Law School. Th thanks for that, Steph. It was a really fascinating talk this evening. I just wondered, from your time as an associate lecturer and a central academic, and your focus on teaching and learning, what you've learned from our students. So, Cara's asking, um, during your time as a central academic, and associate lecturer, what have you learnt from our, our students? I've learnt that they are the most fantastic bunch of determined people ever. You read some of their stories and they cope with deaths. Some people give birth sort of the day before an exam and still pass. Some people have horrible things happen to them and they plough on. And I just think that the determination that it takes, and you see this at the graduation ceremonies when people say who's a carer and who goes to work, and nearly all the students do, and yet they somehow managed to squeeze three years, six years out of their lives to get a degree. So I think the fact that they are wonderful, really. Thank you. Thanks, Cara. And a question from Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Hardy, and I'm also from the law school. And it was great to hear about um, Steph's career. So thinking about her academic career, what would you say do you think is your greatest achievement? Um, it could be sitting here now with you <laughs> just possibly I didn't pay her to ask that by the way <laughs> but actually when I got the teaching award for the 12 introductory steps because that was doing what I love best which is I distilled 120 hours of stuff or 1200 hours of stuff two modules 1200 hours of stuff into little nuggets that people could do in three hours and it did help them to pass their level two exams so I think probably that was the greatest work of condensing I've ever done. Thank you. Hi, Steph. Um, a, a, a fascinating um, uh, discussion. Um, and I found myself thinking about uh, Keith Starmer's um, uh, proposed plans for constitutional reform. And I wondered if you were sitting in a room with Keith Starmer what you might be suggesting to him in terms of constitutional reform to improve democratic accountability for legislation. Great question. If you don't mind introducing yourself so everyone knows who you are and where you're from. So Mark Fenton O'Creevy from uh, the, the Faculty of Business and Law. That's great. Thank you. And would you like me to repeat that? Right. One? Yeah. So uh, Mark is asking about Keir Starmer's uh, proposals for constitutional reform. So if Keir was in the room, and I'm sure he's listening online, uh, uh, what, would you, uh, what advice you would, would you be giving him in terms of constitutional reform uh, about making law making more accountable, given your research? Well, I'm going to piggyback on the Hansard Society here because they're better at this than I am. And I think there should be a parliamentary committee in the House of Commons only that has about 15 people and their job is to scrutinise delegated legislation because they don't. There is one committee that's got members of both houses on it, but the other two or three committees that ever look at this stuff are all based in the House of Lords, so they're not accountable, really, and they're not elected. And also, I think you know, some of the stories one hears about peers, maybe some members of the House of Commons are a bit more feet on the ground, and I think it should go through the House of Commons because, as I've shown you, some really important stuff is done there. So I think a, a Commons committee, it's not realistic to say that the Commons should scrutinise all of it because they haven't got the time. But a, a committee, which is where most of the real work in Parliament happens anyway in select committees, would be a good idea, I think. So that's what I'd like to see. Thank you, Steph. So we've got a couple of questions at the front and one at the back. So um, if we could pass the mic that way, thank you. Hi, my name's Tricia. Um, I'm a friend of Steph's from a local church in town. 
Firstly, so very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Um, your passion for accessibility and plain English is to be commended. And I just wondered if there's a way that you can extend that passion out into other academic institutions or if there are moves afoot to do so, because it's something that's sadly lacking. So, so the, uh, Tricia was commenting on your passion for plain English and she's wondering, uh, other than in the open university environment, how you can perhaps influence other institutions because plain speaking, plain English is sadly lacking in other institutions. So any thoughts on taking that uh, crusade out beyond the, the walls of the open university? Well, I suppose if I've convinced all of you that plain speaking is a good idea, you can go to all the places you work and <laughs> move and your friends and you can tell them actually the long words aren't really very clever because nobody understands them and there's no point in teaching if people don't know what you're telling them. So all I can ask is that you, if you agree with that, you go and try and do the same thing because <laughs> I don't think, although today is very exciting, I don't think I've got that much power outside these four walls. <laughs> very modest. So we've got a question at the back. Thanks. Nick Braithwaite from the STEM faculty. Thank you very much for your clarity. I wondered how much you knew about other examples around the world. Where are the jurisdictions that we really should be modelling ourselves on, oh. having been the mother of Parliament? We, we've got a lot to learn by what you tell us. Hmm. So Nick's uh, wondering uh, uh, about what we can learn from other Parliaments. We've been the mother of Parliaments, but uh, you're suggesting there's things for us to learn from other jurisdictions. So he's worried, wondering which jurisdictions do you think we might be able to learn from? And, you know, in principle, do you think uh, that, that kind of comparative study of, of law and constitutions has got uh, something to offer for our understanding of our own constitution? I suspect comparative constitutional study has a lot to offer, but I'm afraid I've never done it. I've always been very much an English law person, and um, some of my colleagues will be able to tell us that much better than I can. I don't know whether we want to volunteer. <laughs> but I'm afraid I haven't. I don't know. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. And then Andrew. Hi, Steph. Andrew Gilbert from the Open University Law School. Uh, your work with Professor Rebecca Probert on weddings law has been instrumental in leading to a change in the law, making it possible for people to marry how they want to marry. I wonder where you rank that in terms of your achievements and contribution. So Andrew's asking about your research on uh, we weddings and wedding celebrants and that uh, um, that's been influential in terms of um, where people choose to marry. He's asking how would you rank that research in terms of your achievements uh, reflecting on you know, the impact you've had there and the, the research that you've done? Well, at the moment it's only a Law Commission proposal and the Law Commission is only empowered to set up a framework under which the government and the Parliament, if it so chose, could enable all those things to happen. But if it happened, I think it would be fantastic because I think people should marry as they want to. And much as I love Church of England traditional weddings, it's not for everybody. It's not appropriate in our society now that people should be shoehorned into that or into a totally secular ceremony at a register office. So I think people should have a choice. And if it happens, I'll probably be told to enjoy it. But if it does, I should be very proud of that as an achievement. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. So I think we've got some questions here. So Kim, thank you. Uh, thanks, Steph, and congratulations, by the way. Um, Kim Barker, also in the law school. I was just wondering if you think devolved legislatures have got something to learn from the way we do it in England, and if not, maybe whether England should be learning from how we do it in other devolved legislatures in the UK. So Kim's asking about the relationship between the experience and practice within the English legislative system compared to what we can learn from the devolved legislatures. So I'm afraid devolution, a bit like international, is another gap. <laughs> I told you I'd say usually a lot. Yeah, um, yeah I, I really don't know enough about what they do. What I've seen, they, they look slightly more civilised, which I think would be a good thing if it was a bit less like a bear pit and a bit more like a debating chamber. Um, and I think there is lots to learn from being civil to people, which I think would really help if it happened in the UK Parliament. Thank you very much for these questions. So we've got uh, one uh, here, Simon, and one at the back. So maybe Simon next, and then uh, Sophie at the back, I think. S Sophie, is it? Yeah. I think. Um, Hello, Professor Powell. I just want to say thank you so much for that really inspirational and informative lecture. And I kind of had a question um, with kind of a personal slant as well. And it would be, 
What would be your key piece of um, wisdom or your key pieces of advice for somebody who is in the early stages of their academic career? So that was Sophie that. from the, uh, uh, the law school and uh, she's asking uh, for some advice you'd give to early career researchers based on your own experiences of research and the success you've had. And so what advice would you give uh, early career re researchers? Um, I think career? take every chance you get, whatever it is, however unpromising it looks. Because if you find something that you think, I don't understand that, which is what happened to me in delegated legislation, it can take quite a long way. And I think you shouldn't be shoehorned into stuff that you think ought to be interesting. <laughs> Just do what you find interesting and stuff you really want to know because then you'll be motivated enough to trawl through the minutes of Privy Council meetings and other, <laughs> other sad things like that to find it. So I think I follow your dreams is a bit of a cliche, but it's something like that. So somewhere over the rainbow territory, that. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think Simon. Thank you. Uh, Simon Lavis, Open University Law School. Thank you, Steph, for a brilliantly clear and interesting um, lecture. Um, just on the question of uh, delegated legislation, a number of your examples were relating to the coronavirus pandemic. And there's an argument to say that in an emergency, the government can be empowered to make um, more important legislation more quickly to deal with the situation. I know you talked about the one example where maybe the health secretary could have been had more foresight. But I wonder where you think the balance lies between um, empowering government in those situations to make, uh, to make legislation without scrutiny um, and, and, and the scrutiny procedures that we could have. So, Simon, that was quite a long one. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> it wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. So get, I think I heard get, enough. Get, oh, did you? Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> It's a constitutional lawyer. Um, yeah, I think it is right that when things are a genuine emergency, you need to trust the government to act. So I do think probably that the early lockdown was necessary. I, don't, I didn't look back at what regs caused that. But I do think it's also a very useful cloak sometimes. So I think maybe the answer is that the decision about whether it's an emergency should be not left to one person, which it was. And I think if, you know, there could be a cabinet meeting, which it wouldn't be great, but it'd be better than nothing, or an emergency meeting in Parliament, and they could have a debate and say, yes, OK, this is an emergency, do what you think. And I think that would be fair enough. But um, it is very hard because, obviously, we've seen a lot of unprecedented stuff in the last three years. But um, I think it's probably that, that the decision shouldn't be just subjective and unilateral. OK, I think we've got time for perhaps one more question. Um, Yes, just at the back, Carol. Hi, thank you, Hugh, and thank you, Steph, for such a wonderful lecture. And as you might, I'm Carol Howells, also from the law school. Um, and as Steph might guess, I'm going to ask something about the devolved legislatures. And the Welsh, the Senate, and the Welsh government have set out an ambition to um, codify the law for transparency, so that all the law can be found in one place. And I wonder whether you think that it would be possible to achieve transparency of that sort with laws made from the UK Parliament. Thank you, Carol. Would you like me to repeat that? So Carol is asking uh, your views on the uh, uh, proposal from the Welsh uh, Senate to codify their laws to make it more transparent so they can be found in one place. And she's wondering if that's something that we can learn from in, our, uh, in the English setting and would it even be possible, do you think, to, to do that? Well, having, like most of my colleagues, sat in libraries that are floor to ceiling of very, very thick books with decisions that are basically now the law of the courts, I think it'd be very hard to achieve. I think it'd be wonderful because it'd be great if everybody could just go and look up the law without knowing anything about how to do so. They're just books called the law. But if you're going to do that, you have to have a lot less detail because one thing I did discover a little bit about is French law and there is a code, but it's much less detailed than our law. So a lot of the detail that we have now would be lost if you did that. Now, you could argue about whether it's a good idea to have the law quite so detailed or whether there should just be general principles. Um, I don't think, as the question is phrased, I don't think it would be possible, but it could be an ambition to at least do distilled essence of some of the most important laws, which in a sense is what the textbooks do. Um, 
but they're not available to everybody because they don't tend to use language like I use tonight. They use language like the funny bit. <laughs> so I think it'd be a great idea, but I can't see it happening. So certainly not in anybody here's lifetime. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. And I think we've got time for just one comment. So Astrid's been um, monitoring the, the chat online. So. so, Hi, Steph. I've got one question that's come in from our colleague, Christy, Kristen Reed, yeah. who was the senior lecturer in the business school. And she just says, brilliant lecture. Not a question, but a comment. It would be very interesting to hear your take on Brexit at some point. Ah. <laughs> well. I, I you... promised, didn't I? <laughs> but since I'm asked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that <laughs> whatever I say I'll alienate half the population <laughs> I, I, I voted to stay in because I don't think the EU is perfect I think there is corruption and I think there are all sorts of problems but I think we're probably better off being in a trading block with the countries we're closest to than having arrangements to send meat as far away as you can get and still be on this planet. So, from, you know, if I had my vote again, I'd, still, I'd go back. But I'm not the leader of the opposition, nor am I a parliamentarian, so it won't happen. But. OK, well, thank you, Steph. That's all we've got time for. Let's give Steph another round of applause. And we'll right for that one. Thank you, Stephanie, uh, for an excellent lecture. I really feel empowered now a little bit about, but about law. Uh, I always wondered where, where the source of unaccountability lies. Uh, I think you gave me some hints to that. Uh, and uh, information asymmetry that seems to be pervading through even the legislative procedures. So we, we strive for continuous improvement and uh, we welcome audience feedback in helping to shape the series. Uh, so please do complete the feedback forms uh, which we'll, we'll send you after the event. Uh, all that remains for us to say is thank you for joining us uh, this evening and for always supporting the OU. Uh, for those here in person, in the auditorium, it is time to celebrate, so please join us downstairs. Our next lecture in the series is on Thursday, 20th April at 12 p.m. Uh, when Theodore Zaminopoulos, Professor of citizen Late Design, will give his inaugural lecture on citizen Late Design Details will appear on the OU research website soon. And that brings to close this evening inaugural. Have a good evening.